Who's going to pray for us? I don't know about you, but that's making me hungry. You can't smell the tacos? Or chili or whatever it is she's making? We should all go down there and say, mm, share with us. It's a nice lady. Uh, I said, you know, you should feed them salads because this is too hot to be standing in here because she's got no AC in there. And she's working, yeah, none. I said, I'd be doing salad. She goes, I can't get the kids to eat salads. I go, tuna salad, something, pasta salad, you know, <laughs> something they'll eat. Do you know you can make salad out of macaroni and cheese? Did you know that? Oh, yes. Macaroni and cheese, you throw some tuna in it and some other stuff, and it's good. And it's cold, so it tastes good. You know what? Oh, you've never tried that before, obviously. I know how to eat cheap, because in college, that was the only way we could eat. We used to go beg bones from the butcher. No kidding. Back then, you could get bones for free. And the guys figured out we were broke, and they used to leave a little meat on the bones for us. They felt sorry for us. That was back when you, people would do stuff like that. We were broke in college, so my roommate and I. Anyway, OK. Who's going to pray for us? I, don't, I tell my husband about my college experience. He goes, you were abused. Because his family at least made sure he had food. My parents didn't have a lot of money, and they sent me to college, so I never complained. I just went. And they sent me $100 a month to live on. And it wasn't that long ago. $100 a month. That was 25 a week. Um, so I definitely always got little jobs here and there to try to survive. And they paid for my tuition, and they uh, paid for my books. So it was the best they could do. And so we ate a lot of strange things. We came up back, that was before Hamburger Helper, and we had something we called macaroni and cheese deluxe. And what macaroni and cheese deluxe was, was when you had broccoli and hamburger meat to put into your macaroni and cheese. And that was a big deal for us, because otherwise we just ate macaroni and cheese, and we were happy. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, it made it easier for me to appreciate things. Bow your heads, please. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this phrase you can teach us physical science. Hope it's be a good day today at Field Day. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Got your test out. Lydia, thank you. Uh, honey, just, hey, Lord, help us out. Thanks. Amen. It's fine. Okay? Remember, shortest prayer I know of in the Bible? Well, the shortest prayer I know of is help me. There you go. You ever done a help me prayer? That's a prayer. I had a horse run away with me once. That's all I got out. <laughs> Seriously, took, I took 76 stitches in the face, and they thought my back was broken. I had hoof prints all over my back, and all I could get out before I hit the tree and was totally destroyed was help me. And God knew I was talking to him. And when I went in to Shans, like I said, I took 76 stitches in the face, and it cut through the lip in both places, so they didn't know if it, the, the nerves were shot, so they didn't know if it would heal. And the horse danced all over my back because the saddle uh, had twisted underneath him. And to get rid of me, he was stepping all over me, trying to get rid of me. So when I got to the, I'm telling you this because a help me prayer works, OK? Because of the God that we help me prayer goes to. So when I went to the uh, of Shans, I was living up near Shans then. And when they took me to Shans, like I said, I took 76 stitches in the face, but the guy that was on duty was never there, at the, and he was there because he was covering for somebody, and he was their best plastic surgeon. He redid my lip like three times, which I wasn't real happy about that at the time, but he would do it, and he goes, nope, it's not good enough, and he'd take it all out and do it again. And he did it three times, but see, I speak for a living, so it was important that it, it you know, and then he says it may just rot away because the nerves are shot, so I don't know if it's ever going to be right. And you notice it, it looks fairly normal, so that was a God thing. When they looked at my back, they could see, they had me on a backboard for like hours and hours because you could see the hoof prints all over my back where the horse had danced on my back. And they said, there's got to be damage to your back. And they did like every test they could think of and they couldn't find any damage to my back. And they kept coming in with new people and going, there's got to be something wrong with your back. You know, you, we can see that the horse danced all over your back. And I kept telling them, but I prayed. And they're like, no, no, there's got to be. And I go, but I prayed. And after they kept me on that stupid backboard for like six or seven hours, just running all sorts of tests, they finally said, there's nothing wrong with her back. It should have been broken in many, many places. But I threw up a help me prayer because I saw it coming. <laughs> I saw the tree coming. There was a huge 200 pound Great Dane that came up and he was poncho. He was a sweetie, but the horse didn't know he was a sweetie. So when the horse saw the dog, 
the horse just lost it. And I'm an experienced rider, and I had that horse's head pulled all the way back to my foot. He should have stopped, and he did not. He freaked out, and he just proceeded to go through the oak trees, and those kind of oak trees with the long, sharp, uh, yeah, the scrub oaks with the long, sharp points. And when I hit it, I remember coming up, going like this, thinking, man, I wonder if I lost all my teeth. Because it hit so hard right here, it should have taken all my teeth out. And it didn't. And my kids were on two horses behind me. So I'm immediately thinking, oh my gosh, are my kids all right? And I stand up and I'm throwing dirt out of my every place, right? And I turn around and my kids, God bless them, I had taught them. As soon as they saw there was an emergency, they both slid right off the horses they were on. So they're both standing there holding their horses. Thank God. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, you're all right. They both look at me and just start crying hysterically. And I'm going, man, I must look really bad. And my husband wouldn't let me see myself because I looked really bad. And I go, well, I got to go home and change before I go to the hospital because my pants were full of dirt. You know? I mean, he goes, no, honey, you're going straight to the hospital. And when I got there, I had to go to the bathroom. So I got to go in. And when I saw myself, I thought, that's why he didn't let me see myself. It was really bad. And when my mom wanted to come up, I'm like, no, mom, I don't think you should come up yet. I think you should give me a couple weeks before you see me. I think it would have scared her half to death. You'd think I would have stopped ridden horses after that, but I still have a horse. It's a sickness. Anyway, sorry. Help me prayers work. Yeah. Because the God that hears the help me prayers <laughs> works. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so, hey, it was a great witness to the people in there. It really, really was. I had students say, oh, you had a horse wreck. I thought that was so funny. Anyway, you ready? Okay, got your test? Adam, and Adam, you should have said something about it's the smallest unit in, of matter. There you go. Yeah. Say something like that? Good. Molecule, when two atoms hook together, two or more atoms link together, something like that. Concentration, you should have said something about an amount of something in a given volume. So how much of something is in a given volume? Yes? Okay. If you have a question, let me know. This is the time to ask. Uh, because I'll be honest with you, um, your big sister today had some questions and I gave her credit for it because I liked her answers. So please ask if you ever have a question, okay? Number two, sulfur is a yellow powder that is composed of sulfur atoms. Sulfur dioxide is a colorless poisonous gas that contains sulfur atoms. Is sulfur dioxide composed of atoms or molecules, would you say? Molecules. molecules. Now, there'll be some students that argue, well, but molecules are made up of atoms. Don't go there. That's not what he's asking. He's asking you, is this atoms or molecules? And if this can be broken down, it's a molecule, right? Okay. Um, number four. Whoops, excuse me. Number three. While looking at a historic grave marker, you find a statuette that is blue, green, in color. In order to read the inscription, you scrub the surface of the statuette and the blue, green color comes off as a fine powder. What color is the statue underneath? Penny colored. Good. Penny colored, copper colored, brownish red, brown, anything like that will do. Okay. Uh, number four. Which picture represents a bunch of atoms? And which one represents a bunch of molecules? Picture B represents a bunch of atoms, and picture A represents a bunch of molecules. Just right. Thank you, Lydia. I'm sitting here thinking that we need to start this experiment because it's going to have to sit for about 10 minutes. Everybody get your thermometer out, OK? Get your thermometer out. What we need to do is this. First. You, have you got your thermometer out? D don't touch the uh, bulb. Yeah, you can touch everything but the red part. That's fine. Now, first, it'd be helpful if you could read it. So hold it up, and let's measure what the temperature is. Where did my glasses? There they are. Let's measure what the, don't, don't get your fingers close to the bulb, though, guys. Don't, don't hold it on the sides or something. Your hot little hands will warm that thing up real quickly. Everybody's got theirs? You can read it? All right, we're gonna, you're going to need to write this down, so get a piece of paper. This is going to be our observations. Now, the first table, which is Lydia, Molly, and Rachel. What is the temperature that yours says? 73. That's what it was. And maybe it's warmed up, though. What does this say? Yeah, it's about 78. 78. That sounds about right. Okay, what's yours, Wyatt? 80, 81. Is it really that high? All right, I'm going to put 80. Okay. 
Uh, Zachary and Zachary? 75. 75. Do you guys go by Zach or Zachary? You too? Yeah. Okay. Um, Carter and what's your name, sweetie? Ben. ben. Did you send me a picture yet? Yes. Okay. Okay. I got to find it. I don't remember seeing yours. So, okay. Thank you, Ben. Um, Carter and Ben, what does yours say? Don't get your finger near the, the uh, bulb, sweetie. Okay. Oh, keep, you know, hold it from the top. How's that? What does yours say? Um, get, get Ben to help you. 70, 77. Okay, you both agree? It's 78. All right, that's fine. I'll put 78. That works for me. All right, we're going to swing right over here. Amanda? 79. And Colin and Clay? 81. Well, maybe we should have stuck with that one, huh? Okay, um, Rebecca and Sarah? 75. Girls? 73. 73. And gentlemen? 79. Okay. Now, first off, I want you to notice the variation we've got. We're all sitting in the same room, and that's exper experimental error. So we've got all this variation because of all these thermometers are different, even though they look exactly the same, don't they? Now what I need you to do, and you've got to do this carefully, because I don't want you getting it all over your books, is I want you to take one cotton ball and just kind of squeeze it out. Don't get it too hot with your fingers. Listen, once you've got it squeezed out, just lay it down on the plastic bag with your thermometer on the plastic bag and put this over the bulb. Don't squish it down, just lay it on the bulb. And now we're going to go ahead and continue to grade the test while that sits for the 10 minutes it's supposed to sit there. Okay? Okay, thank you. Let's go back to number five. Number five. You are reading a scientist's notes and you notice a measurement that is listed as 12.3 kilograms. What are they measuring? You tell me. What are they measuring? Length, mass, or volume? Mass. Mass. Very good. Very good. Okay, what is the prefix for 1,000. Kilo. Kilo, good job. All right, how many centimeters, I'm not doing that, I'll get in trouble. How many centimeters is 1.6 meters? You should show all of this work. You have meters, centimeters, one times 100. Okay, so that's gonna give me 1.60 centimeters. So you should show all that work, don't do it in your head. Okay, uh, the next one says we start with 0 0.12 kiloliters. We want to know how many liters that is, so we're going to go kiloliters on the bottom, liters on the top. This is the big one, so this gets 1,000. So that's going to give me 1,2,0 liters. That'll cancel, and so that'll give me 1,2,0 liters. Okay, uh, let's see. The next one, number 9. We have a rock that is 45.1 kilograms, and it asks us how many slugs. So we're going to go kilograms down here, slugs up here, and we get a 1 next to slug and a 14.59 next to kilograms. And so, there we go. Um, and that's going to give us, I don't have my calculator right now. What is it? 3.09. Thank you. 3.09. And that leaves us slugs. Thank you, ma'am. And then, let's see. The last one, number 10. Ammonia is the active ingredient in many household cleaners. Suppose... I were to make up two buckets of cleaner. In the first, I take five cups of ammonia and add them to 45 cups of water. In the second, I take five cups of ammonia and add them to 30 cups of water. Which is the most powerful cleaner? The second. The second one. It's got a higher concentration, so the second one is. Now, because there are only 10, 11, 12, 13, there's only 13 questions on this test, and I wish that was not the case. The more there are, the less points each one is. Okay? So we're going to count everything as seven points apiece. In my classes, you always start with 100 and subtract what you missed. Okay? So if you missed Adam, it would be seven points. 
Do you see how that works? Any, yeah, that's the problem with only having a few questions on a test is everything's worth a small fortune. Seriously. If you missed a couple of them, I would take the test again. Serious. That way, you know, you can get a better grade. Okay? So always go from 100 and subtract the number that you missed. And each one's worth seven points. Okay. Let's go ahead and put that away and let's open up to module two, please. Did everybody write this down? You need to write all of it down. Okay? Write all of this down under your observations for this lab. Yes. On the, the average. Oh, what's the average? 77.5. I'm going to write that down too. So the average, 77.5 degrees. Good. Thank you. This is table one. This is ta the t second group, the third group, the fourth group, fifth group, sixth group. Seventh, eighth, ninth. Okay, so we're going to go back that way when we do the next measurement. Okay, we're on page 25, which is module two, and we're learning about air. <coughs> now, the moisture content in the air is called humidity. You guys can try this at home, okay? Take two glasses, put ice water in both glasses, put one glass in the refrigerator. Put the other glass on the countertop and come back five minutes later, okay? And look at the two glasses. Pull the one out of the refrigerator, put it next to the one on the countertop. And what I want you to do is I want you to take your finger and wipe down both of them. What you're gonna find is the one that's on the countertop, you're going to be able to wipe a bunch of water off the outside of the glass, aren't you? Absolutely will be able to. You know that, if you put a glass out it, it, it's going to sweat, isn't it? Okay, that's what we call it. Whereas a glass that's in the refrigerator, there's less humidity in your refrigerator, and so it won't sweat. It'll get cold, and it might even fog, but it won't sweat. I want you to try that when you get home. Okay, will you do that for me? Now, what you're doing is you're actually working with the humidity when you do that because the glass that's in the fridge, the refrigerator has a very low humidity. That's part of the reason the refrigerator works and therefore uh, it won't have water on the outside of it. It might get a little foggy, but it won't have a whole bunch of water on the outside. But the one that's out in the room with us where there's a lot of humidity, especially if you put it outside, you would see a huge amount of humidity that would establish it. It's not because of the heat, it's because the water in the air. If you did the same thing here or in Arizona, even if it was the same heat, you'd find the one in Arizona wouldn't have all the water on the side of it and the one here would just be dripping, wouldn't it? Okay, that's because here in Florida we have a very high humidity because we have a lot of water in the air, don't we? And somebody tell me, why do we have so much water in the air in Florida? Yes, sir, Carter. Thank you. We have water on all sides, don't we? Literally, it's a peninsula hanging out in the middle of the water. And then if that's not enough, we got all sorts of water crisscrossing the state, don't we? and all over the place. So the humidity level is intense. A matter of fact, I will ask the ladies this. How many of you ladies have ever been someplace like Michigan or New York or someplace like that? Okay, did you notice your hair was totally different up there than it is down here? Yeah, all the girls are smiling going, yeah. That's, and the guys are like, what? Okay, <laughs> it's because the humidity just, yeah. Why it's going, I haven't noticed, man. Okay. <laughs> The girls notice these things. Why? Because the amount of humidity causes our hair to frizz and girls don't like that. But because of where we live and because the amount of water in the air, which is the humidity, our hair frizzes. Like I said, you guys, you know, but us girls, we notice these things, okay? So, and we live in South Florida anyway. It's just how it is. So, uh, so humidity is the water in the air. And it says for you there that it's the moisture content of the air. It is. It's the water in the air. But try that thing with the ice water in the fridge and out of the fridge at home. Leave it for five minutes in the fridge. Leave the other one out for five minutes. And then pull them both out side by side and just run your finger down the side of the glass. And you'll see the humidity difference between the room and between the refrigerator. If you really want to have fun, put the one outside because your house is probably air conditioned, which drops the humidity level. Outside, it's not air conditioned, and therefore the humidity is going to be what it is here in Florida at this time of year. Yes, Molly? 
Do we need to do a write up of that? No. Okay. But if you choose to, it'll be extra credit on the next test. Okay? All right. And I just want you to know your extra credit on any chapter will count towards extra credit on any other test because when they all average in, it helps all of them. So I just want to give you the heads up on that, okay? Yes. How many points do you get? Um, usually I give whatever one question is worth, the lab will be worth that. But I'll never give you less than five points for a, you know, an extra credit lab. So even if the test questions are less than that. But like today it would have been worth seven points. Okay? All right. Um, so define humidity for us. It's just the amount of water in the air. And <laughs> how it's supposed to work is that when we sweat, the water evaporates if you live someplace where there's less humidity than Florida, or in the winter time, this would happen here. Because the winter time, the humidity levels down. And so then the water evaporates off of our skin, and the idea is it cools our skin. Now let me explain to you why that is. And this is the kinetic theory of matter, and this is for real. I'm not just trying to look like an idiot. I do it so well, but I'm not just trying to look like an idiot. Okay, so you ready? In solids, the atoms and molecules in a solid vibrate. Uh, and so that's what makes them a solid, is they're not moving around, but they're still moving, they're just vibrating. So let's say ice, we're gonna use ice, water and gas because it's all three the same thing just in different phases, right? Solid, liquid, and gas. So ice, uh, they're, they're vibrating, but it's a solid. When we add energy to it, the vibrating guys can start dancing. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. And that's what makes it a liquid, is dancing molecules have more energy and they're a liquid. That's why liquids pour, because they're dancing molecules. Does that make sense? This is for real. This is actually chemistry. This is the kinetic theory of matter. Okay, I just do a weird version. <laughs> anyway, and I teach gases using bumper cars and it works. Uh, seriously. Um, and then when the dancing molecules continue to get energy, let's say it's a dancing kid that now somebody's pumped them full of Coke and birthday cake. Okay, then they go from dancing to belting off the walls. Woo, 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 right? That's a gas. So what happens when you take some of that energy away? You take the energy away and bouncing off the walls goes back to dancing. You take more energy away and it goes back to uh, ice. Kinetic theory of matter. With me so far? We'll come back and build on that later. <clears throat> that means that if you take water, liquid water, and you want to turn it into a gas, you have to add energy to it so it can start bouncing off the walls, right? Do you understand? So when the sweat <clears throat> evaporates off of our body, it has to take energy away from our skin to put it into the water so the water can start bouncing off the walls. See the picture? You understood it too, didn't you? Now you actually know why sweat cools you off. Because the water actually absorbs the energy so it can start bouncing off the walls and removes it from your skin. Oh, makes sense, doesn't it? Now where this breaks down in Florida, is that if we have a bunch of water in the air already, there's no place for the water to go. So it won't go into the air. So we just kind of sit around soaking wet, feeling miserable, right? But how many of you have ever been someplace like Arizona or someplace out west, and it was 90 or 100 degrees, but you didn't feel that hot because the sweat just evaporated right off of you, so you never got wet. And people out there get uh, heat stroke very easily because they don't know how hot they're actually getting. Whereas here, we're painfully aware of how hot we are, right? <laughs> da, 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 you know? Okay, now, with that in mind, let's look at our experiment. And would you please read your thermometer, ladies, and tell me, everybody look at your thermometer and tell me what your new temperature is. And I'll go around the room. We're going to write it right next to our old one. So, ladies, what is it now? Seriously? Where's, hang on, where's my glasses? Oh, that, that did go down. Let's say 74, okay? All right, so there's a 74. We got to do this fast. Look at it because it's going to start going up. What'd you get, Wyatt? What, you and Cal? 75. What'd you get? 
70. Gentleman in the back. Um, 76. Very good. 70. 70. Wow, some of them went, really went down. Um, Colin? 60. I think it's broken. Okay. Can you help them, Fiona? Does it really look like 60? 70. 70. Okay. It's all right. They're hard to read. They're really small. Um, 71. 71. Thank you, Rebecca. And 64. 64. Gentlemen? 72. 72. Now, yeah, and if you would, give us an average again. What are we seeing happening here? You should write this down. This is supposed to be in your observations of your lab. This, these are our observations. What do we see here? What's the temperature done? Drop down. Drop down. And now you know why. Because as the water evaporated, it's sitting here in the same room with us. It shouldn't have gone down. The reason it went down, because as the water evaporated from the cotton ball, it actually had to remove energy from the thermometer for that water to go from dancing to bouncing off the walls. And in the process of doing that, the temperature went down. So it removed energy from the thermometer, just like it removes energy from our skin when we actually sweat and it evaporates. Yes, ma'am? 71. 71. So there is our average. This up here, remember, guys, is the average. So we see the average of all of them that it really did go down. Now, these would be your observations. Your conclusion would be that when water evaporates, it removes energy from whatever it's evaporating off of. And that's why we're cooled down. That was the point he was trying to make there. And it is really cool that God set us up so that we have a um, system to cool ourselves off. We have thermostats back before, you know, God's got a good design. Before anybody came up with AC, God had it all worked out. Okay, then we're told about something called a heat index, and it's because... Have you ever heard somebody say, well, it's 85 degrees, but it feels like 98? You ever heard somebody say that? Okay, that's got to do with the heat index. When you have a very high humidity, then what happens is it makes it feel hotter than it actually is. And so because of that, um, and the reason is, is because the water right off our skin, so you feel much hotter than it actually, temperature-wise, says it is. That's a heat index. And so it's mentioned on the bottom of page 26, where if you have high humidity, then it's not able to evaporate off. And so the combination of the temperature with the humidity is reported as the heat index. You know what? Let's just write that here. Well, uh, I guess we can. So we have temperature plus humidity equals the heat index. There we go. The next words that it's got there is absolute, absolute humidity and relative humidity. Absolute humility, humility, I like it. Humidity is the mass of water vapor contained in a certain volume of air. And I don't know if you notice this, this is mass per volume. So you can actually define absolute humidity as the concentration of water in the air. Concentration of water in air. That's my short version for concentration. Okay, it's just too long to write out. I've been writing it that way since college. Um, concentration of the water in the air. Now, I want you to understand, at higher temperatures, the water can hold more, the water. At higher temperatures, the air can hold more water. At lower temperatures, the air can't hold as much water. And it's because there's less energy in the air when it's colder. Makes sense. So to hold that water, it's got to have a lot of energy. So the hotter it is, the more water it can hold because it can hold, you know, it has more energy to hold it. So far, so good. Now, most of us, absolute Humidity is not going to help us. We need relative humidity, and that's the one that really helps us. Relative humidity, and ditto marks mean whatever's above it 
you're bringing down again. That'll help you in your note taking. It makes things a little shorter. Relative humidity is actually given to us as a percentage or a ratio. So relative humidity is, and I'm going to give this to you as a fraction, okay? It's the water in the air divided by the maximum amount of water that the air can hold. Max water air can hold. And what do I mean by the air can hold at that temperature? It's the max amount of water that the air can hold at that temperature. So in other words, let's say at 85 degrees, the, the air can hold, um, you know, a liter of water, which is intense, but I don't know how much air we're talking about. Let's say it can hold a liter of water. But it actually only has a half a liter in it. We would say it's at 50% relative humidity, wouldn't we? And if it was at 50% relative humidity, that means that there's still plenty of room for the air to suck up some water, right? Because it's only half full. 50%, it's only half full. That's good. Usually in Florida, we're over 80% relative humidity, which means there's only a little bit left to suck up any water. And when it's raining, it's 100% humidity. It's not sucking up anything at all. Okay, you get the drift. So does everybody understand how relative humidity actually tells us more? Because it actually tells us how much room there's still left to be absorbing water out of the air. Whereas this, unless you know how much water the air can hold at that temperature, it really doesn't tell you anything at all, does it? And you've got to think of the air like a sponge. If it's saturated, it's like a sponge that's got, it's holding all the water it can and, and it's not going to hold anymore. Whereas if the sponge only half full, it'll still suck up some more water, right? So that's how we've got to think of the air. Okay. Uh, so the on your own questions on page 27. It says, suppose you left a glass of water outside on two different days. On the first day, it's warm and humid. On the second day, it is the same temperature, but the humidity is low. Each day, you measure how long it takes the water to completely evaporate from the glass. On which day will the time it takes the water to evaporate be the smallest? The second. Right, the day with the lower humidity, it'll evaporate out much more quickly, won't it? Very good, thank you. And 2.2, suppose you did the same experiment that was described in problem 2.1, when the relative humidity was 100%, how quickly would the water evaporate? Not very quickly. No, I don't think it would at all. 100%, it's basically raining, right? Good, okay, so very good. Turn the page, please. 